Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media. I just want to hand over the reins to girls and let them tell their own stories. Caden Trail is one of Missouri's and the country's greatest assets. There's something to discover around every corner. Today on Spotlight, the history of St. Louis told by audio stories. Plus, a book uses diary entries and everyday experiences to explore what it's like to be a teenage girl. And then a group planting thousands of trees along one of the country's greatest trails. But first, too selfie or not too selfie, that is the question of a new study. It's Sunday and you're watching the Emmy Award winning Spotlight. Enthusiasm for spring outings and summer getaways is growing, and many people are ready to make memories. One expert says too much picture-taking takes away from the enjoyment of just living in the moment. We find that when people take pictures of experiences that are otherwise highly enjoyable, we find that taking pictures of those experiences makes people enjoy the experiences a bit less. Robin LaBeouf, professor of marketing at Olin Business School at Washington University in St. Louis, is co-author of a revealing study involving several surveys with more than 700 participants. She says the data can help companies, businesses, and travel destinations develop new business and marketing plans, especially at a time when snapping photos almost nonstop is on the rise. Before, we were limited by you know, how many rolls of film we had and how much it would cost to buy the, that, those rolls of film, get them developed, right? So we might be limited to 24 exposures on a roll. Now we have you know, unlimited capacity virtually. We can take as many pictures as we want. We can store them forever. In one part of the study, participants watched videos, including this one, a documentary that's considered highly enjoyable. We had one group just watch it. We said, you know, here, watch. Imagine that this is a, you know, a nature tour that you're doing or, you know, a video experience that you're having. Watch it and simply just take it in. And then we asked another group to watch it and take it, and we gave them the same instructions. But we also asked them to you know, also take any pictures that you would like to take, and do that by clicking this button. And we found that the people who had been asked to take pictures ended up enjoying it less than the people who hadn't been asked. LaBeouf says the results are likely surprising to people based on one of the study surveys. And I think people often think either it doesn't matter or maybe it makes things better, but we're finding that it, that it makes it worse. Making it worse for a range of experiences. Stepping out of the moment to try to document the moment, I would say these findings would apply. LaBeouf says the research applies to taking pictures and shooting videos during experiences people find highly enjoyable. The study doesn't even get into the time and distraction of posting and interacting on social media from the location of the experiences. And what about selfie overload in our selfie-centric society? Selfies might be even more distracting, and now you're not looking at the image, you're trying to line yourself up in the picture, and it's an even more distracting action than just taking a picture. The findings apply to big events or small ones, including the ability to enjoy children's birthday parties, sports, and performances. And the study pertains to the fulfillment people hope to have by going to new places, eating out, or simply going on springtime nature walks. In something that's that's static, that theoretically you could stop and enjoy for as long as you would like to and then take pictures of, I think we sometimes forget the stop and enjoy step of it. And we just start, jump straight into picture taking. And then after we take pictures, we say, okay, I'm finished and now I can go. And we never have that moment of just stopping to experience it. LaBeouf says the study offers new insight for a range of businesses and destinations as to why they may want to create a new plan of action. Firms want their customers to enjoy the experiences that they're having. If they find out that, hey, people are taking too many pictures and it's undermining their enjoyment, that might reduce people's tendency to spread positive word of mouth about the experience, to share their experience in different ways. Um, so there might be things that firms can do, maybe interventions that they can do to get people to put down their cameras for a few minutes and maybe stop and enjoy the moment more, and that might you know, help the firms with their bottom line. She wants to make one point clear. Actually having some photos and videos from many moments in life are, without a doubt, 
valuable. I'm glad that I have pictures of, say, my son's first birthday party, but perhaps taking those pictures made me enjoy it less in the moment. So there's this tension between documenting for posterity and documenting for the sake of nostalgia later on and enjoying things in the moment. So maybe the best thing would be to make sure you have pictures, but if you're really worried about enjoying it, maybe you shouldn't be the one taking them, but maybe outsource it to somebody who's less invested in the, in the situation or in the moment. Downtown St. Louis, a place full of beauty and certainly lots of history. It felt like there were stories around downtown especially that were literally right underneath you, right under your nose that people didn't know about. Now those stories are having a rebirth of sorts thanks to Adam Frick Verdine, the founder of Unheard Of STL. Unheard of STL is an interactive audio map that explores St. Louis's diverse history through cinematic audio stories. He says cinematic audio stories are kind of like little short films for your ears. Like the story of Percy Green who climbed the arch to protest a lack of black workers. After we got to about 25 feet up, somebody said, hey, 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 what are you doing? And by that time, we would laugh. You say, oh, sorry, my friend, too late now. And we... We, we, we was on our way. The interactive map currently has 10 different topics about St. Louis history, and each story is about three to five minutes long. We want to cover as much ground as we could. There's black history, women's rights, native stories, and we wanted to make sure to include an LGBTQIA story. Illustrations from a local artist help visually create each scene, and archival photographs, or photos of the site as it is now, brings context to each space. All but one are fully scripted, and so we're recreating, we're imagining what Virginia Minor might have said, or um, the James Ede story has a lot of direct quotes from some of his speeches. It's not an app, it's a free website, so you don't have to be at each spot to hear the story, but it does make the experience more interesting. They're all fully produced with actors and sound design and fully scripted, so it's not a walking tour, it's not just somebody telling you about the history, you hit play and you're inside the story. While standing in front of the old courthouse, you can bring yourself back to 1872 with Virginia Minor, who sued the city of St. Louis for her right to vote. Virginia Minor was working at the same time as Susan B. Anthony was, just in a different part of the country. Ultimately, when Susan B. Anthony, when they made a larger movement, they took a lot of ideas from Virginia Minor. I tried, Francis. I said, Mr. Happeset. I'd like to register to vote, please. And he just sent me right back out. You're lucky. Susan B. Anthony was jailed for voting. But at least she got to vote. Then there's a story about hairdresser to the stars, Buddy Walton. Anyone who was anyone stopped by to visit Buddy for a rinse, comb, or style. Mr. Walton grew up in a small town near Potosi, Missouri, in the Roaring Twenties. While his brothers played sports, Buddy fixed his father's hair. Part of his story happened at the Majestic Hotel. Although seeing it today, you'd never know. And that's one of the main reasons for this project. So we wanted to bring as many points around downtown to life in that way as we could. It's a history lesson that just might get you to take a second look at something you've seen several times. That's what I love about audio is that you can be in the physical place, but you can be experiencing sort of something different. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. What do 30 young girls living around the world have in common with one another? What do they do in their free time? What are their favorite subjects in school? What are their hopes and dreams for the future? These are the questions that journalist and author Masuma Ahuja set out to answer in her new book, Girlhood, an adaptation of her series for The Lily, previously published by The Washington Post. I went to The Lily and said, hey, I have an idea of doing a series which is like the opposite of news, basically, where I just want to hand over the reins to girls and let them tell their own stories. The book focuses on the individual experiences of young girls in their everyday lives. Beyond the limited scope of stories we see in the media. Beyond the rich and famous. Beyond tragedy. Who are the girls that might otherwise never be heard? Everything I read painted girlhood in a way that didn't feel real. There was either one side was like all the horrors or the other side was like this is what influencers live like, which is very like celebrity culture type stuff. And the vast in between where most girls exist, where I existed as a girl, just wasn't, wasn't anywhere to be found. 
pulling from diary entries and pictures of girls around the world, Girlhood offers an inside look at the everyday heartbreaks, aspirations, trepidations, and pure joys of being a teenage girl, giving a unique perspective to the power of girlhood. I read through this book sometimes when I'm feeling down, like when Sophie read, for example, about like stress and pressure about applying to college and feeling like the vast unknown in front of her. I related to like my past self related to that. And also my present self relates to that a lot. Even now, um, there, there are girls who write about a few of the girls left home, moved far away, either to cities away from home or to other countries and write a lot about like homesickness and being far away from their families where I live on another continent from my loved ones and I relate to that a lot and like turn to them for advice about just like how do you get through it and is it worth it and how do you stick with it um some of the girls wrote about you know the like the importance of like sticking with things when when it seems like all the the cards are stacked against you and you have to just like power through and and keep going because you have no choice, um, which I turned to inspiration. So really it's like every girl wrote about something that I felt so seen by and I turn, turned to at different points to go back and remind myself of like why I've done this and why it matters. And I, I hope that everyone who reads the book also feels similarly. It's just like, I've never been to St. Louis. I've never been to like most of the places in this book. Um, and at the same time, I feel like I, I know people there and I feel like I relate to people in these places. We actually have one of the girls from the book here today and her name is Sophie Chapel. What do you think is one of the biggest things that you've gained from being a part of this project? Um, honestly, just like being able to show other girls kind of like who I am in like a raw, in kind of a raw sense, because like you guys both said, I didn't get a lot of that growing up either. Um, a lot of times, like with social media, I saw this kind of like picture perfect, you know, lifestyle. Um, and then like the article that I was a part of, I was writing diary entries about like how I was so scared about college and like getting into college and things like that. And so I think like one of the biggest takeaways that I've learned is just, again, like how similar we all are and how it's so important to like use your voice to share your story because you never know how similar it could be to someone else's. I think it's really important to switch that perspective and then be like no I am important my opinions are important and I think you're doing such great work thank you so much Masuma and Sophie for being here today thank you so much for having us yeah thank you so much um, we're both so happy to be here you can purchase this book now at Novel Neighbor or on their website scan the QR code on your screen with your phone's camera to watch the full interview and find out other similarities she noticed between girls around the world a style of jazz with a gypsy influence, later on Spotlight. Today we're in one of the most beautiful parts of Missouri along the Katy Trail in the Missouri River Valley. And this place is special for a lot of reasons. It's got a lot of history and it's got a beautiful landscape. We're overlooking thousands of acres of river bottom fields and the Katy Trail is one of Missouri's and the country's greatest assets. And it's not just a trail, it's a state park. What we want to do along the Katy Trail is not only give people a place for recreation, but a place for education and conservation. We're standing in front of a lot that used to be an old building that had been a part of this community for over 100 years, but it had fallen into bad disrepair. And as much as we like to conserve and preserve things, we had to take it down. But it's directly across from the Katy Trail trailhead in Trelaw, Missouri. And it offers a great place to teach people about the beauty and the diversity of Missouri river bottom trees. And so today we're here to begin a planting of some beautiful trees of all kinds. We are donating mostly native trees. The American smoke tree is probably one of the most beautiful fall colors that you'll, you'll see. We've donated pecan, a hackberry, sugarberry. Our champion that's gonna be right out front and center is, uh, is a bur oak. And uh, near Columbia, the largest bur oak in the United States is the McVeigh bur oak. And that was one of Dan and I's favorites for the last 30 years, 40 years. We have a larger one from Pea Ridge that we can make a real statement here in Trelaw. 
So it's very locally grown native tree with the best broad canopy. So we're going to put some bottomland trees. We're going to put some uh, native fruit bearing trees to bring the wildlife in that has kind of been lost in a little urban spot. Long term, our goal is to reforest areas between here and St. Charles along the Katy Trail and the Missouri River. Before the Missouri River was channelized and before the river bottom was used for agriculture, it was filled with trees just like we're planting here today. It was filled with oaks and hackberries and sycamores and all kinds of fruiting trees. Lewis and Clark survived on pawpaws for several days that they picked along the riverbank. Those trees were cleared for agriculture. So what we want to do with the trees at Tree Lore is illustrate the kind of trees that were here before settlement. We hope in the future, partnering with Forest Relief, a St. Louis based not-for-profit, to plant thousands of trees along the Katy Trail and along the river and in the communities between here and St. Louis. And that will not only provide shade and interest and fun for people on the Katy Trail and in those communities, but it'll provide homes for wildlife and pollinators. St. Louis, we're going through difficult, confusing, and often frightening times. But AGC Media is here for you in new and expanded ways with free educational resources, critically acclaimed author interviews, books save you if you're going through a bad time, virtual art fairs, local COVID research. This is kind of a home run, a dream response to the vaccine. And much more. HEC is honored to help our arts and cultural communities survive and thrive and to show you there is strength and hope in St. Louis. We're at Art St. Louis and we are presenting our 25th annual Varsity Art Exhibition, which features undergrad and grad level art students representing 22 regional colleges and universities. So the art instructors invite two students from each department and they select the artworks with the students. And it's also representing the learning that the educators are providing and the overall institution. So these two students are representing the whole school as well as their own selves, their careers, their media, their work. The reason that this exhibit, or some of the reasons why this exhibit was created to begin with, was that we thought it was really important to highlight both the emerging artists who are in artistic programs in the St. Louis area, as well as their professors, adjunct instructors, the art departments, and the institutions, because those institutions are key players in the entire creative world of St. Louis. They are teaching students how to have conversations about their works, and they're teaching their students new techniques, how to use the media, all these opportunities that one has in an art education experience that they might not necessarily have outside of school. So the artworks in this exhibit, there are ceramics, there are sculptures made out of paper and mixed media. There's analog and digital photography. There's painting and acrylic and oil. There's some printmaking. There's some illustration. And the 44 pieces in the show have a lot of personal experiences about identity, about contemporary culture, about race, about gender, and that's represented in all these techniques and media and styles, which for me is always exciting, and the community enjoys this show especially every year. You can find this exhibit as a virtual gallery on our website at artstlouis.org, and you can also visit the gallery in person through April 1st. For content that keeps you coming back for more, go to hecmedia.org. When you walk through a storm. Celebrating the people who are really putting their lives on the line. Be entertained. I like to take a piece of flat material and form it and transform it into something that's three-dimensional and interesting. Get inspired. 
the next pandemic, we won't have to pivot and try to get ready for something. We'll already have that in place. Learn something new. We're all from St. Louis, and we really just wanted to be able to give back to the city and see the city grow. Connect with your community. I had never written a book before, and I just thought it would be a really good way to do it and, and bring the experience to the reader. Go in-depth with experts and your favorite authors, all in one place. For original programming and award-winning content, go to hecmedia.org. It has been called the crown jewel of St. Louis, but Forest Park is more like a collection of gems. And author Carolyn Miller has spent the past two years taking inventory. There's something to discover around every corner. At 1,300 acres, Forest Park is so large, few people have seen it all. But as an avid runner, Carolyn Miller has seen most of it which is why Reedy Press approached her to create a book of Forest Park walking tours, a pathfinder to curiosities, familiar and obscure. I think my favorite little gem is the Spanish Cannon. It was actually given to the city of St. Louis by the War Department in 1900. It was forged during the Spanish-American War. And St. Louis didn't have a place to put it. And so they stuck it in the horse stables in Forest Park. And it sat in there until somebody wrote an op-ed in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch in the voice of the cannon, kind of complaining about living with these horses and how it needed a place to live. And so in 1901, the city of St. Louis built a little area in Forest Park for the Spanish cannon to sit. The book maps out seven historic tours and one nature walk. Many points of interest along those routes are the things visitors see all the time, but have no idea about the story behind them. I love the visitor center. It used to be a streetcar stop, a streetcar pavilion. The Cabinet House, that's the first brick farmhouse west of the Mississippi. And then there are the less familiar sites, like the joyful Musicians Memorial, the somber Korean War Memorial, and the baronial Van de Venner Place gates. These gates were the entrance to a very posh, ritzy St. Louis neighborhood um, in the late 1800s. And so all that was left of it were these gates and they moved them to Forest Park so that they wouldn't just disappear. Kind of a weird, weird story, uh, but they're, they are beautiful to look at. There's a time in each year that we always hold dear, good old summertime. Most St. Louisans know the two remaining permanent structures from the World's Fair are the flight cage at the zoo and the art museum. But the book also points out other ornaments in the park that are part of the fair's legacy. So many different really classic things in Forest Park were influenced by the World's Fair or purchased with funds from the World's Fair. Um, I'm thinking of the apotheosis of St. Louis, of course, the sculpture of Thomas Jefferson in the lobby of the History Museum. During the fair, they had a waterfall flowing down Art Hill, and it was called the Cascades. And so after the fair ended, they decided to build a waterfall sort of in tribute to that original waterfall. And that fall is actually the start of the water system in Forest Park. Well, and on that score, a lot of people probably don't realize, uh, because you can't really see it anymore, that River de Pair runs through Forest Park. That was my favorite fact that I uncovered, because I had no idea. They channeled it into these giant concrete pipes and pushed it underground so that when the city hosted the World's Fair in 1904, nobody could see it, which I just thought that was a really cool fact. Like so many St. Louisans, Carolyn Miller feels a personal connection to Forest Park. It's where she met her husband, and like a lot of brides, she used the park as a backdrop for her wedding pictures. I took some on the bridge to Picnic Island, and I think I was the third bride in line for that bridge, but I took a lot of them in Kennedy Forest, and there were no brides around at all. I did get a lot of burrs in my wedding dress, so <laughs> that, that was a problem. <laughs> The history of Forest Park is the history of us, a collection of personal recollections, touchstones, and traditions enjoyed by the generations before us 
to be enjoyed by the generations that will follow. And now, thanks to Carolyn Miller's hard work, for the rest of us, learning about its treasures is just a walk in the park. The fact that you can go to Forest Park and see a Monet and a polar bear all in one day for free is just incredible. I mean, I think not a lot of cities can, can say that. We're just so lucky to have it. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. week, a biochemist mom who created a healthy smoothie for families using natural ingredients from around the world. Plus, why an artist was inspired to create 27 life-sized paintings of these particular women. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.